Hello. Welcome to this Sunday YouTube session. Um, hoping we are live now. Just give me a quick um, thumbs up or something if you can hear me okay. Hopefully. <clears throat> Um, oh, I think my chat thing's not working. Oh, perfect. Cool. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Welcome to the welcome to the session. We're going to go through some GCSE biology content today. Um, so we're we're looking at a part of the spec. Um, well, we're going to look at classification and taxonomy. So it's it's a part of the. GCSE specification that you do again at A-level. And in fact, you actually don't really build on it that much. So what you learn for GCSE is pretty much all you need to know for A-level if you're going to continue it. So that's kind of handy. Um, we could do mitosis in one of the, the future sessions. Yeah. If you remind me again at the end, um, I'll make a note and we can we can probably do that like in one of the sessions in the in the future. Yeah, no problem. So um yeah i guess let's let's make a start so i'll share my screen um one second so hopefully you guys are now looking at a powerpoint um yeah so we'll we'll dive straight in I guess a little bit about me before we start. So uh, my name's Alex. I'm the head of biology here at SnapRevise. Um, I've been teaching and tutoring <laughs> biology for the last uh, four or five years now. Um, yeah. So we've got three objectives today. So we're going to look at the system, the classification systems that were first sort of invented by Carl Linnaeus. And then we're going to look at how genetic New genetic analysis and data has led to uh, we've we've changed this system. So you might have heard of the three domain system. This is the new way of doing it, based on new data. And then we'll look a little bit at evolutionary trees. So <coughs> these are also known as um, phylogenetic trees. You might have heard of that word instead. Uh, and they show how organisms are related. So yeah, we're not going into the evidence of evolution today. These are the spec points. Uh, this is AQA. Um, I'm not going to really talk about it too much. The, this content is um, necessary for all uh, specs, so it's, it's relevant for everybody. Um, you should all have a copy of your specification as well. If you don't, just go onto your exam. <coughs> Sorry, got a bit of a cough. Go onto your exam board website and download it. Um, it's super easy. So, yeah, and. If you haven't been to one of these sessions before, um, basically we're going to go through the topics and then I'll introduce some information and then we'll do exam questions. That's the usual sort of routine. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be asking questions to you guys. I encourage you to, to try and answer them. It, you'll get more out of the session if you actually try typing out an answer rather than just like thinking it. Because um, sometimes you think, well, it just it's much clearer if you if you write it out, and I can also read your answers and look for any any mistakes that might be might be in there. So yeah, first question <clears throat> to everybody: um, What is the fossil record, and what does it show us? So you can either do one question or the other, or or both. What is it, and what does it show us? <clears throat> yeah, nice Oscar. So it allows us, it's almost like having a time machine. It allows us to see what was going on with the animals on, or plants and animals uh, millions of years ago. So we can use it to see 
um, how things have evolved. So it can be kind of hard to work out which species may have evolved from which other species just by looking at them today. But if we see the sort of gradual changes that, and see the intermediate species that have come and <coughs> that have like been and gone, but that's a sort of like they bridge the, um, the gap. This allows us to, to interpret um, how, how things have evolved. So the fossil record, this is um, all the fossils found globally. And yeah, shows us um, how or what plus animals um, would have looked like millions of years ago. <clears throat> now the fossil record is not perfect. There are gaps in it. And actually it's not that common <coughs> for an animal or a plant to die and actually to be turned into a fossil. It's quite rare, you need very specific conditions. And even in the best case scenario, you don't really get soft tissue preserved. So things like bones and shells, they fossilize pretty well. So we often get, that's pretty much all we, <coughs> all we usually get. And we don't really get much of the soft tissue. So we can, we can look at the skeleton and we can make some sort of assumptions from that, but we won't really have any detail of the, the muscle structure or the ligament or any of the organs in these animals. We're kind of semi-guessing with that. We, we can look at animals that are alive today and see what might have been there, but the soft tissue tends not to get, not to get fossilized. Um, so yeah, we're not talking too much about fossil record today. That's just something that you should have already. Um, and the second question, well no, third question, I guess. What factors can cause extinction? So we're currently in uh, what's being called the Anthropocene. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this is the sort of the era of humans and we are causing a lot of extinction events to happen uh, with the amount that we're changing the planet today. So humans are a big one, but there are also natural things that can cause extinction. Yeah. Food, um, change in food supplies, or predators, yeah, predation, that's two good ones. <clears throat> Climate change, nice, yeah. This could be natural or caused by humans. So for example, the <coughs> relatively recent history, there's been a lot of ice ages. So that's quite drastic changes in climate and it occurs relatively quickly. And there were a lot of animals alive in the last ice age that died out as we came out of the ice age. So climate change seems to be a factor there. Um, anything else you can think of that might affect um, or cause extinction? A few other things, there could be like freak events, like asteroid impact, which is what we think killed off the dinosaurs. Um, disease is a good one, yeah. Disease can definitely wipe out um, whole species, populations. Um, even stuff like volcanic activity. It's unlikely that the actual volcano erupting is going to wipe out a whole species, like the actual like lava flows or the, um, the, the ash. But what can happen is if it's a big volcanic eruption, it can put a lot of particles in the atmosphere and actually leads to climate change. So volcanic activity and, <coughs> and climate change are sort of, it can be related. Um, and we think possibly, yeah, it was some volcanic activity that was triggering the, um, the sort of start and end of the ice ages. We're not 100% though. Um, 
Cool. So let's look at classification. So what does classification mean? What's your guys' understanding of the word classification, if you had to define it? Or it might be something. It's probably it's quite a hard one to define. Yeah, nice Oscar. So dividing groups of organisms into yeah the sort of the groups that we use species, kingdoms, and domains. That's some of the the levels we use. Um, more generally, classifying just means grouping things based on yeah common traits or certain characteristics. Um, yeah, nice. Nice, Ikra, exactly. And what? Well, and Oscar as well. Um, yeah, so grouping things based on certain <coughs> characteristics or traits. Um, so the, the first person who really thought to classify plants and animals was uh, Carl Linnaeus. He was a, a 19th century botanist from Sweden. So he's sort of seen as the father, father of modern taxonomy. He wasn't the first person to, to sort of try to group animals. People were doing that um, for, for Quite a, quite a while before that, but he's he was the first one to to do it with a more, I guess, more like methodical method, and we still use his uh, method as the basis for uh, taxonomy today. So, what should we add? Swedish botanist, um, and in his lifetime, he classified around ten thousand species <laughs> so he identified and sort of um grouped them into different groups um so ten thousand, quite a lot uh, to do in well in for one person in one lifetime uh but still nowhere near the total amount we, we think that the estimates range quite a lot from around five million to a hundred million for the total number of species <coughs> on this planet so we're not exactly sure we've currently identified just under 2 million unique species, but we find more all the time. So we don't really know how many species there are. And unfortunately they're going extinct so quickly that we'll actually never know how many species there were before humans came along. So things are going extinct before we can even classify them. Um, so Carl Linnaeus, he based things um, into groups on their observable characteristics. On, or Observable um, for example, you could group things that had fur together or scales or like spines or <coughs> number of eyes. Um, like leg type do they have legs do they have wings um what do you call that appendage um <clears throat> so yeah purely based on observable characteristics what could be some problems with this with this system if you group things together just based on what you can see and these um, these might give you a little sort of clue as to some issues with this.
Yeah, nice. That's the um, a good keyword to throw in there, Ikra. Yeah, something called convergent evolution and Oscar as well. Perfect. So one big problem with this is convergent evolution. So all this is, is animals that have evolved um, similar features, but are not closely related. <laughs> so an example of this could be like bats and birds. At first glance, you might think they're quite closely related because they both fly, they've both got wings, but actually, as we, as we know, bats are mammals and birds are birds. So they last shared a common ancestor actually quite a long time ago. So they're not very closely related at all, even though they maybe look quite similar. Another example would be you could group everything together that has fins. So you put sharks and dolphins and sea turtles all into the same group because they've all got fins. But again, they're not closely related. The turtle is a reptile. But <laughs> the shark is a fish and the dolphin is a mammal. So they're actually all very differently, distantly related, but they could be classified in the same group. And like, for example, we could classify the spider and the octopus in the same group because they both have eight legs and sort of round bodies. That would be, there's some arguments to group like that, but it doesn't really tell us much. Oh, it doesn't tell us anything about the evolutionary history. And it's not really that useful to group things purely based on their arbitrary characteristics. So what we've moved into uh, in more recent times is um, so-called phylogenetic um, taxonomy. So we, we group things together, so group things based on their evolutionary history. Um, so, yeah, so the closer that things are related, the, um, the smaller the group, we'll, we'll put them in. So you hopefully have seen um, the system before. So we're going to fill in some some gaps here. So we're going down. We're we're classifying Homo sapiens humans. Um, so this is the species. Um, can anybody tell me any of these other ones? I can number them. Four, five, and six. So. Yeah, <laughs> what are the missing things? Actually, we can do these as well. Seven and eight. Yes, it's the animal kingdom. Nice. So kingdom up top and animal. Perfect. Then what else have we got to fill in? Mm -hmm. Genus. Perfect. So the genus is the one up from um, species. So the genus Homo, we're actually the only species, humans, the only species left in that genus. There were other ones. They've all died off. They've all gone extinct. We think humans probably did have a sort of uh, impact in that. Phylum, yeah. Um, order, yeah. Class, nice. And then family. Perfect, so we've got the whole taxonomic system. So kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. You need to know that. So a lot of people have a mnemonic to help them remember it. Um, one example would be keep ponds clean or frogs get sick, that's one, there's, there's lots. So um, whichever uh, you use, <coughs> it doesn't really matter as long as you can get them in the right order. And then yeah, domain, we'll talk about a little bit later, that actually goes above kingdom. 
Yeah, exactly. And then does anybody know what what class are we in, humans? Anybody got a guess? So chordata, this means vertebrates. So things with a backbone. <laughs> so we're in the vertebrate phylum. And then our class, I'll give you some other examples of vertebrate classes. So birds, reptiles, fish, other ones. Yeah, we're mammals. So, um, so we're in the mammal class. Uh, yeah. So going down, these groups get smaller plus more specific. Or you could say more closely related. So if you're in the same family, you're pretty similar. Uh, whereas if you're only in the same class or phylum or kingdom, you're more distantly related. <laughs> if you're in the same genus, you're very similar. So um, yeah. Mammalia. Yeah, the, the correct, the proper way to write it is actually mammalia. Yeah, but you can kind of get away with saying, with saying mammal. Um, noise. So yeah, this is kind of <coughs> a way of representing the, uh, the grouping. It's, it's a hierarchy, so it's non-overlapping groups within groups. Kind of the same as how you save files on a computer. You know, you can put folders inside folders, which can then be inside other folders, and you, sort, you can click through, getting more and more specific. It's exactly the same thing for this uh, classification hierarchy. Um, okay, so yeah, we use the binomial naming systems. So this is the thing invented by uh, the system invented by Carl Linnaeus. So he had the idea of using Latin names, um, which was beneficial. I mean, it didn't have to be Latin, but before. Before this was standardized, people called uh, the animals, whatever they called them in their own country, in their own language. And it was quite confusing for scientists to work between different countries because there was different names for all these different animals. So colonists gave them Latin names. You can still call the animal by its, its sort of normal name in, its, in whatever language you're speaking. But if you're writing about it in a scientific paper, you use the binomial name. So there's a specific way of writing it. You need to put it in italics. And you need to put the genus name first, then the species name, and you uh, capitalize the, the genus name. So this is capitalize the genus. And the whole thing is in italics. So if you're handwriting it, because you can't really handwrite in italics, <laughs> reliably, because some people have very slanty writing already. Uh, so what you do if you're handwriting it is you just underline it to, to signify, and that basically like, signifies that it's in italics. So that's the correct way to handwrite it. Um, another example. Is this. This is the Latin name. Any guesses what uh, what that is? Yeah, cat, common house cat, domestic cat. <coughs> so we're going to look at uh, one particular genus. This is the Panthera genus. So this is a genus of big cats. There are five species in there. You'll probably have heard of all of them. Um, so let's go through and work out what they are. So these, <coughs> these are their names. You sometimes see the genus name written like this. They do P and a dot. This is like a short form. If you're going to write it out lots of times in your essay or in your journal that you are publishing, um, you can sometimes abbreviate it like that. Uh, yeah, good question, Oscar. Yeah, it's reasonably common. So another example of that <coughs> would be like the gorilla which is in the genus gorilla, but also the species name is gorilla or uh, rat is like ratus ratus. So this is usually when it's the, the first one that was identified. Um, 
it's given the same genus and species name. And then other species that are identified uh, later that are similar will go in the same genus, but they're going to have a different species name. So yeah, it is, it is <coughs> reasonably, reasonably common. And if, if it is that, it's probably uh, quite a widespread animal that they've um, grouped. They've, they've named the whole uh, thing after it. So, yeah, what do we think these are? Oh, some of them, well, in fact, they're all fairly, fairly obvious. I mean, these ones obviously are jaguar and snow leopard. Oh, they're already written on there. Um, what do you think the top three are? So Panthera leo, Panthera tigris, and Panthera pardus. Yeah, the first one is a lion. <coughs> so leo is Latin for lion. Um, you might have you might have heard of that before. No, plants also have double names. So the binomial system is for all plants and animals or for all life on earth so bacteria as well will have a binomial naming system fungi will have a binomial naming system it's for for all living things then tigris this is a tiger probably <coughs> fairly obvious then this one may be less less obvious this is actually a leopard so yeah there's five uh, species in that genus and they're sort of located all around all around the world um so all right let's go to the next page yeah you guys with me so far hopefully um we'll try some questions now to to put that into practice so this is a typical <laughs> sort of way you might get asked um, a question on this topic. So they're going down for king penguins and emperor penguins. Um, so we can see here they're in the same, well, actually, I'm not going to give it away. Uh, they're different species, but they're quite similar. So they share all of the groups down to the very bottom level, other than species. So. Just double check. What are these groups? <clears throat> and you can see here, these are also uh, vertebrates. And they're in the bird class, so the avian class. Um, Yes, kingdom. Phylum. Yeah, four genus. Nice. And then this one, order. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. <coughs> yeah, no problem. Don't, yeah, definitely worry about typos. Um, very easy to, to happen. So yeah, that could be one way that you ask this in an exam. And this is quite a typical style of question. So. Um, since Linnaeus uh, sort of proposed this classification system, there's been quite a lot of advancements in biology. Um, so we are now 
classifying things uh, more accurately. We've had to move um, lots of things around. So things we originally thought were closely related, we've since realized that actually they're not that closely related. And things that we thought were more distantly related, we've actually realized are more closely related. So <clears throat> to begin with, we pretty much just had anatomy to look at. So we'd look at, usually they're just dead specimens and scientists would examine them and decide which looked like they were the most closely related, which is most similar. But anatomy can be deceiving. So like we talked about convergent evolution, um, purely looking at the anatomy can lead to things being grouped incorrectly. So now we have a, like a better understanding of uh, genetics. So we can use um, like DNA uh, and RNA sequencing. Um, so we can just, we can sequence the DNA. All this means is like reading. Reading the DNA bases. So you can sequence the DNA of any living thing uh, and you can just feed that into a computer and the computer can tell you the percentage difference between the DNA. So for example, between ice abba, so between humans <coughs> and chimpanzees, our closest living relatives, we've got around 98% uh, similarities of DNA. Um, between something like human and a dog, a bit less closely related, around 80% the same. Um, and even down to like a plant, humans and plants still share around 40, uh, around 60% of their, their DNA, um, <clears throat> which might seem surprisingly high, but it's because a lot of the enzymes that are needed for metabolic processes, plants also have the same ones. So they need, they need the same um, genes. So we've also got, we've had improvements in uh, microscopes. Which have allowed us to examine uh, cells and tissues in much more detail. So there, there were microscopes around when uh, Linnaeus was uh, in his lifetime, but they've subsequently got way better. So they only had optical microscopes back then and their resolution wasn't as good as we can do now with an optical microscope. And obviously since then we've developed uh, electron microscopes, which can see uh, many, many, many times more detail than a light microscope. So you can't really see organelles with a light microscope. You can see the nucleus, but that's pretty much it. Whereas an electron microscope, you can see all of the organelles in the in the cell. So this has also helped us see sort of the internal features. And we just um, have got sort of a better understanding of genetics and evolution. <coughs> um, cool. So let's talk a little bit about the kingdoms. So this was the original like top top group and Carl Linnaeus decided to put th things into five kingdoms. So can you identify what these are? Certainly Probably one and four, quite easy, hopefully, and probably two, but three and three and five, possibly a little bit more challenging. Mm -hmm. Animalia, or we can just call it animal. Um, but you're right, that is the tech proper word. But for GCSE, it's fine just to say animal kingdom. Mm hmm Fungi, nice. <clears throat> Prokaryotes, nice. So the colloquial name for this is bacteria. But yeah, prokaryote is the better word to be to be using. Then last two, what have we got? <clears throat> yeah, just, just plants is fine. Plant kingdom. 
<clears throat> um, good guess, but not quite. Algae is in this kingdom. So this is algae. So seaweeds are in this in this kingdom. They're a type of algae. Uh, this is an amoeba. And to be honest, I'm not sure what this other one is, um, but it's a it's a type of this organism. <laughs> so this group, this is like an odd one out group. So it's they often have features of um, the other kingdoms. So some of them are single celled organisms, like the amoeba is a single celled organism. So it kind of resembles a prokaryote a little bit. Algae is photosynthetic. So it, it can make glucose from sunlight. That's a bit like plants. Um, some of them are decomposers or saprotrophs, a bit like fungi. So they kind of share features of all the other kingdoms, but they're in their own group because they, they don't quite fit in one of the other ones. So we call them protists. Or another word for it is protoctists. You can kind of use them <laughs> interchangeably. That's kind of like a shortened version of it. Um, so you were quite, kind of close with protosome, uh, Oscar. Yeah, similar, similar word. Um, so yeah, that was the original five kingdoms. But then the new, the newer system, which was uh, developed in the 90s, 1990s, uh, by an American uh, microbiologist called Carl Woes. Um, oh, there's an E in his name. Woes, like that. Um, he decided rather than classifying on just just on the behavior and the uh, um, appearance, like mostly looking at the anatomy, um, he based the new system on evolutionary history. i.e. looking at um, common ancestors. Plus evolutionary uh, pathways. And this is based a lot on DNA uh, and other molecular uh, observations. So does anybody know what the three domains are? Can you give me any or all of them? Oh, we're actually doing it on this next page. <coughs> so domain is above kingdom. And I'll give you a clue. One of the domains is, um, was in the, the, the kingdoms before. <coughs> nice, eukaryotes. So this is all plants, animals, fungi, plus protoctista. Sorry, I have to mute my phone. Then we've got two other kingdoms. Yeah, nice, Archaea. That's usually one that people don't know. We don't really learn much about Archaea. They're basically, they were originally classed in the same group as bacteria. So we thought they were, they were all uh, protoctista. Uh, no, sorry, we thought they were all prokaryotes, but then <clears throat> Following closer examination, it became clear that there were two main sort of different types of prokaryotes, and it was decided that they were so different that they were they were deserving of their own group. So archaea, and then the other ones we just call um, bacteria. So we split prokaryotes into these two groups. Um, yeah, we don't really learn much about archaea. They tend to be um, extremophiles. Um, anybody know what that might mean?
bacteria these are um yeah formally uh, or in the in the kingdom prokaryotes uh yeah they grow in extreme conditions so very high temperatures or very high pressures exactly so um grow in extreme conditions i.e like uh hot springs or volcanic vents on the ocean floor um yeah and they um yeah they can thrive in these extreme environments that other things would really struggle to survive <coughs> oh nice abdullah i like that i like that one i haven't heard that before yeah that's a good way to to remember it basically just yeah have either some people just can remember it in the right order if you can great if you can't use a mnemonic to help you out so let's look a little bit at an evolutionary tree. So um, yeah, evolutionary trees are used by scientists to show how they think different species are related. Um, for extinct organisms, they rely on the fossil record we talked about earlier. So here is a evolutionary tree showing some primates. So these are from the monkey family. Um, <coughs> well, monkey and apes as well. Great apes. So basically, these branches show how many millions of years ago the two different species last shared a common ancestor. So the more recently you shared a common ancestor, the more closely related, um, more closely related you are. Um, so uh, we can see here, so this is humans. Our closest living relative, we already said, is the chimpanzee. And you can see <clears throat> that we last shared a common ancestor with a chimpanzee around five million years ago. So five million years ago, there was an animal that existed that went down two different evolutionary pathways. Some of them evolved into chimpanzees and some of them evolved ultimately into humans, but they shared the common ancestor, um, yeah, five million years ago. Whereas the orangutan, for example, we last shared a common ancestor with an orangutan uh, around 15 million years ago. So because, <coughs> there's more time to have evolved on these different evolutionary pathways. There's going to be more differences. So they're going to, we're less closely related to orangutans and even less closely related to gibbons. And then quite a lot further back with baboons. And yeah, you can sort of see down this evolutionary pathway, tails were obviously selected against and all of these species don't have tails. Um, actually, no, that's not true because the gibbon, what do gibbons maybe not have tails? No, I think gibbons actually, yeah, they don't have tails. Spider monkeys are the ones with the tails. Gibbons, gibbons don't. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's basically what you need to be able to do to, to read a phylogenetic tree or an evolutionary tree. Um, state what a branch means. So that's a common ancestor. And then use that to measure how many millions of years ago they last shared this common ancestor. The more recent, the more closely related, the more distant. Um, the less close related. Yeah, you could definitely be asked to do this. So the question could be like, when did uh, humans and gibbons last share a common ancestor? And you would just say 20 million years ago. That's something you could be asked to do for sure. So yeah, I think that is most of the, that's pretty much all the content we want to go through. And now let's just go through some past paper questions to test, test that. Um, so 
these are from different exam boards, kind of to usually take questions from all the different exam boards to uh, mix it up. So um, this first one, I think this is an Edexcel question. So, oh, this is an OCR question actually. Okay, so <coughs> students were investigating fruit flies for a school project. Fruit flies belong in the classification or the kingdom, the animal kingdom. Um, what type of cells are found in a fruit fly? Wait, why are we doing this question? It's not like directly related, but I guess it's good practice. Oh, sorry, I've knocked the, um, oh, I knocked the wire for the screen and now it's like turned itself off. Um, one sec, I just need to reset this up. So I can't see what your, I can't see this text anymore. Do, 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 do. Oh, well, what's wrong with this? Sorry, T Sex. Okay, I think we're back. Nice. Um, and then share the screen. Like, computer's lagging. Okay. Um, yeah, apologies about that. The, the wire is super sensitive and if I even like touch it slightly, it <coughs> disconnects the screen. Um, so the type of cells in, in a fruit fly will be animal cells. Um, probably Maybe didn't want to say that because it sounded a bit too obvious, but yeah, that's all that's all they're looking for. Um, okay, this is a bit more related to classification. So students collected three different types of fruit fly to study. The three species were Serotitis capitera, uh, Dasis dorsalis, and Dasis olei. What do these names suggest about the evolution relationship between these fruit fly species? <coughs> You have to explain your answer, and it's worth three marks. Hello. <clears throat> so, what are we thinking? Mm hmm Nice. More closely related. That's one mark. Because they yeah, share the same genus. That's our second mark. And therefore, yeah, nice. They uh, shared the most recent common ancestor. So whenever you're saying how close related are they, that means more recent common ancestor. So that's our three marks. One, two, three. Nice. So a slightly harder question now, I would say. Uh, well, possibly not, but we've got a bit of a data interpretation one. So we've got a uh, phylogenetic tree. This one looks a bit different because they've sort of drawn in the actual the actual animals. Um, so 
Name each genus shown below, which are not extinct. So this one's slightly different. It's showing um, how they are related to each other, but also when they disappeared from the fossil record. <clears throat> Um, Alyssa, yeah, good, good point. So it could be like convergent evolution. They're all, yeah, in fact, it doesn't actually say much about it. It's, they're all just types of fruit fly. So yeah, you're right. Maybe it's actually not that closely related at all. It doesn't share the same genus. We could look at the next taxonomic level to see how closely related they were. So maybe they're actually still in the same family. But just from that information, we would be able to tell. We could have to, we'd have to look up the this the particular species. <coughs> so, yeah, which ones are not extinct? There's three on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically it's the ones with the lines that are still going. So this is the line showing how long that that species was around. So a lot of them actually didn't last very long, only around half a million years. I mean, that's obviously in like absolute terms, that's quite a long time. Uh, but in evolutionary terms, that's not actually that long. Um, so yeah. A lot of these were quite short-lived. They, they went extinct relatively quickly. The three that's still going, hippopotamus, I'm just gonna write hippo for short, uh, odontocetes, don. so this is like dolphins, and then uh, Mr. Seats is toothed whales. Whales are broadly split into two groups, one with teeth, one without teeth. <laughs> um, then use this diagram to estimate the number of years uh, Dorodon inhabited the earth uh, yeah ask, ask away so this is the Dorodon a type of uh, something similar to like a modern day whale it looks like but they're extinct but like a killer whale, they look similar. <clears throat> so all we have to do, it's quite a long way to do it without a ruler, is basically read off When this when this started, yeah. So it's around five million years. So sort of from maybe 40, 42 million years ago to um, thirty eight million years ago. So we can say five million. They actually accepted anything from four point five to seven in the mark scheme. So as long as you got somewhere, they're quite lenient. So as long as you've got something between that, so 5 million or 5.5, 5, um, it looks slightly bigger than 5 million. Um, anything between that range was, was accepted. Cool. So, oh, that was the last question. I thought we had one more. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's pretty much it for classification and taxonomy. So you should be able to... Uh, talk about Carl Linnaeus and his, his uh, classification system, talk about the difference between the domains and the kingdoms, and interpret evolutionary trees and sort of read data of them. Um, are there any questions from what we went over today? Um, where did I study? I did a biology undergrad at Durham, Durham University, and then I did 
and my teacher training course at Oxford. Are you thinking of, um, where are you thinking of applying? Are you thinking of studying biology potentially? Yeah, nice. Glad to hear it. It's definitely an interesting subject, and it's it's a science that's uh, well, as a subject. Biology is getting, I would say, getting more and more interesting. There's lots of um, new things we're able to do with biology that we couldn't do even like ten ten years ago. So there's a lot of exciting exciting medical developments that are going to come through. Um, yeah, in the next few years, and yeah, I think it's a good a good time to be getting into biology. Hi, Marion. How are you? Um, yeah, and it's, you can certainly go into um, quite a few different things with, with biology. Um, and any science is always a good, a good one for um, keeping, keeping your options open. So yeah, any other questions on what we've covered today? And if not, um, no, Topoka does the Sunday sessions, yeah. So it, it'll be with um, Topoka, yeah. So cool, I think then we'll end the, end the class there. So thanks for, uh, thanks for joining. And um, yeah, it's a good sign that you're studying biology on a Sunday Sunday evening. Um, don't forget to set reminders for these web classes. So we do them once a month and we do them in the other sciences as well. So we've got physics, chemistry and maths. Um, so yeah, you can you can join all of them. They're all free. Um, and yeah, <coughs> if you set a reminder, you won't you won't miss any of them. I think the next one it looks like is uh, chemistry at four o'clock next weekend and maths the weekend after. Um, Cool. Yeah, glad to glad to hear it, Oscar. Um, and yeah, I'll see you on on Tuesday, Marion, for our normal sessions. Okay, great. All right, have a good good evening, guys. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday, and hopefully see you in one of the next ones um, next month. Bye. Bye.